I bought a cable column for my garage gym about four years ago. Now, I recommended it to hundreds of people. What's up, Active Lifers? Welcome back to the Active Life Podcast. I'm Dr. Sean Pastuch. I'm your host. I'm joined in studio today by Isaac, the owner and founder over at Anchor Training Systems. Anchor is the most portable, convenient, effective training tool that we have at the flagship for law, for active life in Long Beach. We ordered 13, actually we have 14, but we have 13 mounted units in the building. It's the only thing outside of a landmine that every one of our stations has for clients to use when they come in to train. It's an essential piece of our puzzle. My parents have one. I have one. I've recommended them to coaches, gym owners, anybody who you can think of. Today, when I sit down with Isaac, we're going to go over how it was founded, what their struggles have been, what they've done to build the company up, and it's a really wild and cool ride that I think you're going to find extremely interesting. Remember, when you do find value from this podcast, give it that five-star rating, write a review, share it with a friend. Let's get to the show. Isaac Lewis, welcome to the Active Life Podcast. Thank you, Sean, for having me. I'm excited to be down here and definitely to see the flagship in person. That was I was looking forward to that and uh, it it exceeded expectations. Well, when I uh, when I wanted to bring you on, my immediate thought was I really hope he wants to come out and do it in person because we could have done this remotely. You're in Boston, I'm in New York. That's what a three and a half four hour drive, depending on if uh, wives and kids are in the car. In my case, and. I just, your, our flagship is like a, a museum for Anchor. Yeah, that's well put. I, I definitely never heard someone say <laughs> museum of Anchor, but mm -hmm. uh, that's exactly what it was. Like it, just the way you have it set up and it was cool to just see how our product was able to thread into the design and the, and the layout that you had in mind. And the second you said, hey, the I'd want to do it in person and zero hesitation. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, whenever there's any time to get in person, it's just so much better. Well, the, <clears throat> the thing is this, you know, our, our equipment, I think is and should be demonstrative of our values. And so the only two things that we have at every station for clients are anchors and landmines. And so while we have bumper plates and by, we have plenty of equipment, dumbbells, all the kettlebells, all the, all the stuff the only things we have for everybody so that they can have their own to use at all times because of the frequency with which we plan to use it are anchor cable columns and landmines. And the thing that I feel best about, and we talked about it when we were in the flagship earlier, is I don't know the people who own the company I buy landmines from. And the mm -hmm. next time that we open a location, I'm going to look at the same ones that we bought, but I'm going to compare the market to them. Mm -hmm. Uh I'm not going to have to look for other cables. I'm just going to come right back to you because I value the people behind the product at Anchor. Now that, that means a lot. And that's where we, we try to be different, that mm -hmm. we are going to have that personable touch. And, and part of that is, hey, we're still definitely you know, a small business. And for some people, too, we'll probably have to explain what, what is Anchor. I know you mentioned cables we will, there we for, will. We'll get for there. people who, who don't know it. But <clears throat> for, for us, the big thing is that, hey, how can we be different? And not just you know the fact that we have a different product that is unique and, and has value in it itself. What's the next layer of that? And that's been trying to, hey, get to know people and be there for them from a service standpoint, which you know we talked quite a bit about in the flagship thinking about, okay, how, how do we do this our way, you know, that we really think we can do something extra for people? Well, <clears throat> so for people who aren't familiar with what an anchor is, I'm going to explain briefly, and if I miss anything, I want you to fill in the gaps. But for us, we were looking for a space-saving, safe, reliable cable that would work without our clients having to pick up any heavy weight and put it onto anything, take heavy weight off. And we wanted to, especially the thing I love about the anchor is that the drag or the, the lag, I should say, when I use a, a cable with plates on it, when, you, when you're whipping it fast, like if you're doing like an ax chop and you're being fast with it, for example, at the end, those weights are still going up and you got to wait to brace for them to come back down. And I was especially concerned about our clients because our clients at Active Life have a fairly low training age <clears throat> and that could be dangerous for them. And I wanted something that would eliminate that. So when I first started looking at all these different cable columns, 
the space was problem number one. You guys solved that problem. Problem number two was that lag. You guys solved that problem. And problem number three that I wasn't even aware of until I started looking in the marketplace was um, no other cable that I'm aware of that is mountable in the way that yours is has an eccentric load component to it. From what I've seen, they're all just concentric, which means I can pull it out, but then going back in, there's going to be no resistance. So for us, it was an absolute no-brainer. Then when you came out to our event and talk to our clients and let them all touch it and feel it. Everybody loved it to the point that we now have your, your branding in our Slack channel for all of yeah. our clients. Cause it's the only cable product that we recommend. Wow. That's awesome. You did a great job on the explanation there. Great. If that, I'm ever looking for work, I'll, I'll come. You, you've got it. That was, that was pretty, <laughs> it was clear, concise to the <clears throat> point. Um, you know, and it's, it's cool to hear someone like you say those things and, see that in our product, mm -hmm. right? Like even when we started out, it's you know hard for me to look back and say, what are the things that people are gonna draw from? But the main part there too is that it's the form that the cable experience came in and that mm -hmm. the cable experience felt good. Cause we even had people early on say, your product's never going to be adopted because it's not digital and really? it doesn't have connectivity and it doesn't have data coming out of it. And they said, hey, you should really mm -hmm. be conscious right now launching a product and this was we launched in 2019 um, was when we started the company that that would be a huge thing. And we right away said, you know what, we're going to, we're going to make the hypothesis that the actual cable experience itself, you know, feeling good, smooth, eccentric, mm -hmm. concentric, you can do isometric. It's not going to slack out on you when you move at speed. Those are the things that people are going to pay for in a more compact, accessible product. Like that was what we hedged our bets on. And, um, it was interesting. I think part of it was just because there was so much fitness tech out there at the time. And, you know, that was growing before COVID in terms of just like large scale direction of the industry. Well, that was the, that was right before the hockey stick of everything needs to be connected, which got amplified with COVID hugely. And then all these VC funds dumped tons of money into the connected fitness space. And now there's none left. Yeah. Right? I mean, there, there's some, I'm, I'm, I'm overemphasizing the, the over indexing that they all did on it. But the idea that I'm describing here is the, I believe there's always utility for something that just works the way it's supposed to work every time. It doesn't need an update every six to 12 months when the new technology comes out. Cause then you're just chasing tech advancements. Your thing is we're a reliable cable com that's going to work and it's portable period. Simple. <laughs> that's it. I wouldn't have, what were they comparing you to, like a tonal? Definitely, I mean, that was put out there, but, you know, and in our, since 2019, I, I can't even think of one customer off the top of my head that, hey, how are you guys different than tonal? Like, they even asked about it because it's it just a very different segment, very different price point. And part of it is, too, we're not trying to replace the coach or the professional, mm -hmm. right? Like, ours is a supplement to those environments where it is at a facility, it's at a clinic, it can be at, you know, I mean, you're, home gym to um, anything in between, but it's not meant to, hey, take the coach out of the picture. It's just supposed to be a tool to aid in that experience. Well, I told you earlier today, the thing that was most impressive to me is this thing comes in like a shoebox. And I'm a <laughs> Jewish kid from Long Island whose wife has power tools, okay? And I installed it in my house. And, and, and that's because I wanted it mounted to the wall. You have a version that mm -hmm. doesn't mount to the wall. So... For me, that was that was the most the most that was that was the most impressive thing, and it worked. But what I want to understand from I want to go back to the beginning because I've never heard you talk about this on a podcast before. What prompted a college student to build a cable column in in, in at, at an entrepreneur school? Where does that come from? Yeah, yeah. So to to get started. I had a really bad injury my junior year of college playing baseball. Okay. So I was in the outfield. Dove Where'd for, you play? So I played, originally I went to St. Lawrence University mm -hmm. um, of State New York and then went to Babson College. Okay. Um, so this injury happened while I was at St. Lawrence and I had a really bad shoulder injury diving for a fly ball, dislocated my shoulder. Luckily it was it was my right shoulder. I, I throw left. Mm -hmm. so Me I too. Still, there you go. Two lefties in one meeting. What are you gonna, it's amazing. You, what hand do you write with? Right. I write it with my right hand too. We're special people. <laughs> <laughs> so do you kick with your right foot? I kick left. Mm, okay. I shoot left hockey, hockey growing I up. Shoot hockey, hockey was the biggest. So. I shoot hockey left too. 
Wow. Racket sports? Confused. Same. I could go either <laughs> hand, and it doesn't matter, but I, I want to favor just doing backhand. Yes. This way because of baseball. Like, same. That's hilarious. Yeah. But side side conversation yeah. there. But from this this injury, you know, I it was the reason I mentioned it, you know, it's my, my glove shoulder because if it was the throwing shoulder, would, you know, that would have been it for yep. me. So I was like, you know what, I want to make a comeback and uh, rehab. So I got really lucky, too. One of my, my best friends, his godfather was an orthopedic surgeon at HSS. Okay. And so I got really lucky having the surgery done there. And because it was an athletic injury, the school's insurance covered it. Because me being even a Canadian kid, not realizing, mm. you know, really experiencing the difference in, in the healthcare systems, too, that, wow, I, I can just have the surgery done right away. And for me, it was huge because, okay, I can get the timeline to recovery started as soon as possible. Would you have had to have waited in Canada? Oh, Likely a, a long time. You know, it's hard to say for sure. But She's just walking around with a dislocated shoulder. For, you know, I mean, you'd hopefully get it reset and mm. then, um, you know, wait and oh. hope it doesn't mess up your day-to-day -day life for too long. But there's so many stories and, and my, almost my entire family is in healthcare, except me in terms of not being a physician mm -hmm. or, or a nurse. Um, I'm, you know, not in, in healthcare like they are. And in terms of hearing some of the stories in Canada, the waiting list for certain procedures are crazy. So I got lucky in, in, you know, in the U S here that I had the surgery done. Well, obviously had that connection to get me in right away with a, a very good surgeon, um, mm -hmm. that got me on track. And after having that surgery, you know, the biggest thing was, okay, I got to make a comeback. I got to get mobility back. I got to get flexibility. I got to be strong enough to, to play again and come back for the senior season. So one of the pieces of equipment that I used a ton was the cables. And, mm -hmm. you know, I always use cables. It wasn't like, hey, I've Big never stack. seen this. Exactly. I've <clears> never <throat> seen this machine before. Um, but they have, you know, one traditional machine. And then, you know, if you're lucky, I saw in a couple facilities, you know, I became familiar with a Kaiser machine for like mm. very high performance environments. And so that felt different. For people who don't know, a Kaiser machine is what's called isokinetic loading. I believe they use air. Yeah, it's all <clears throat> pneumatic power. Right. And, yeah. so, and, so, and so what's going to happen is it's going to weigh the same thing throughout the range of motion where a lot of cables will be heavier at the end or the beginning or... Something yeah. along that And nature. you can use those at speed. And that was where yes. kind of that piece came into play for us uh, later down in the story. Mm -hmm. But so I was, okay, cables were great. And I was with the athletic trainer using cables a lot because easier on my joints. You can mm -hmm. change the resistance, no problem. You can work in so many different planes. So it's like, wow, these are really valuable. And then the observation came, well, they're so great. Why do we only have one cable machine in the varsity room? $15,000? It's okay. <laughs> the cables are very expensive commercial pieces and they're big. They take a lot of space. Like that was kind of the observation that I drew from it. And it was like, well, it'd be really cool if you could make a cable experience that still feels great, has that resistance both ways, but it's more accessible. That was kind of just, you know, the thought that I had. And I sat on that for at least two years. Interesting. Did did the Kaiser's ability to to move fast without the lag at the end influence Anchor's ability to move fast without the lag? You know, definitely. Uh, you mean I, I can't attribute it directly to that. It was more something where you know I mean I hadn't used those machines a ton, mm -hmm. but I realized, hey, what do athletes want to do? What did I want to do? I wanted to move at speed, mm -hmm. and that is a great feature that those machines have. Yeah. So it was like, hey, can we kind of bottle something in that? I personally was like, you know, this would be the cable machine that I would want. That right. was, you know, what it was modeling after my experience of the rehab side, the training side and saying, okay, what would it have to be if we were going to make it? What would it have to, you know, really deliver for, for people? So where do you go from there? Cause I imagine there's a lot of people who have ideas. I have this great idea. Cool. Well, but then I have to just like, I mean, to go from, I want a cable that's portable, that works, that's accessible financially, to I have a cable that's portable, that, that works, that's, that's accessible. That's a uh, big, big step. Because yes. originally it's an idea, and this was, you know, in undergrad still, I was with one of my best friends at the time. This is where, you know, he kind of was is thinking this, of the is idea this, with Is me. your friends, is this the friend whose dad's an orthopedic surgeon? So, or yeah, his godfather. Yeah. So okay. this was back at school and he would be like, Hey, he was really into lifting, really into bodybuilding. And so the friend we, we were talking about, okay. you know, okay, what would be cool? And we were the type of guys who had college, you know, Friday, Saturday night, we would go into a classroom and think about like business ideas, right? Like that's what we were doing, right? Mm -hmm. We were, okay, what would be really cool? And we had this, you know, idea 
And part of it was, well, how do we do that, right? Like, where do we start wait, with certain materials? So we always thought about it and I always thought, hey, this would be really great. And then what happened was I, you know, moved on from St. Lawrence and actually went to Babson College, which Babson College is a small school just outside of Boston and its whole its whole DNA is entrepreneurship. Yep. It's, it starts, and that's what drew me to it. So in between that time, I actually briefly went over and played baseball in, in Europe, which was you know really cool really? experience after uh, the shoulder injury and probably the most fun I've ever played. But was it was it like the way that basketball players play pro ball it, in Europe? It was a little different for me. I actually played on this team that the whole like summer season, the purpose of our team was all American college players to play against. Uh, different, um, which would really be lower level world baseball classic qualifying countries like Team Ireland and Team Norway and Team Greece okay. all trying to play. So we would play friendlies against them to get them ready for like the pre-qualifier to the qualifier. Okay. Um, so we kind of bounced around different countries playing. So that was you know, a really cool That's experience. Really cool. And um, like I said, probably the most fun I've ever had, you know, playing baseball yeah, in just such a different environment where countries where baseball is not a known uh, sport, really, um, or has any following. Um, so it was neat to see, you know, this nice baseball field in, you know, outside of Dublin that's, like, kept up by the local people there because they love baseball and mm -hmm. it draws in the town when we're there. You know, a really neat experience. But um, so I went to Babson after that and was actually hoping to still play. I still had eligibility um, to play one more year because of my injury. And I was about Babson to play. Babson team? Babson had a team, yeah. And huh. the year I decided not to play with my eligibility was the year they went to the D3 World Series. Oh, dude. So, <laughs> but, I, but I don't language. have any any regrets because because of that, that decision, I was going to miss, like, all my classes. Right. And if I'm going to do this year at Babson and this program for entrepreneurship, part of it was we had to pitch a business idea in class. And so, obviously, the only I, I was like, I got one good idea. And I'm gonna I'm gonna go for it. That's such a um, gift, though, to only have one idea. It, it definitely helped with the the focus because there was other things that I was thinking about. Because I actually went to even a session at uh, one of their entrepreneurship centers and told someone my idea. It was like you know a professor advisor there, and I thought he would really get it because he came from a baseball background. Mm -hmm. And he said it's a terrible idea. Really? He said it's. Wait, a, hold, on, hold on. Let me let me go back a step. What was the idea you what was the idea you pitched him? What anchor is today? Or was the idea it, you pitched him something pretty much identical to, to what we ended up doing? Oh, and did you send him one since? Uh, there, there's certain people who, you know what I mean? You, yeah, yeah. you just move on and, and we're doing it to, to grow for our team and ourselves and, and serve our customers, not to, I think, prove people wrong. We, we yeah. really kind of put a stake in the ground on that. Does it maybe fuel, you know what I mean, the fire <laughs> for sure, but it's not, you know what I mean, I would say. So wait, why do you say it wouldn't work? Um, it was something I never understood. It was like, hey, it's a product, not a business. And I thought, well, isn't so that how everything groups. starts? Right. Like, isn't that how everything starts? So there's certain things, too, that I realized from a, a business school background that, you know, like, oh, this is the, the textbook. This is the theory. But maybe some of this doesn't make sense. And that was tough for me because I had no business background. Like, I even did pre-med classes in undergrad. I did some, some economics. But I was pretty wide-ranging. And so for me, I was like, okay, I'm raw, I'm fresh. I don't know anything. So, okay, I'll, you know I mean, take advice from people who've been there. And, and that was something we, we brushed along. And then I, I pitched it in class anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's where I met Nathaniel, who's co-founder of the business. Um, Who hated his own pitch. So he, he had a, an interesting pitch, very different, but he resonated with mine because he had the same shoulder injury from a mountain biking accident. Okay. Same surgery and everything. So he resonated on that. And thankfully enough, he's a... He is the smartest mechanical engineer that I've ever met who can not just, you know, design things. He can build things. He knows materials. He, it was just like, this guy can do everything. You know what I mean? I, I met other engineers who, hey, I'm really good at the CAD work, but I'm mm -hmm. not going to go procure all the materials, figure out how to build it, put it together, how to make it better. And, you know, I mean, he could do everything. Mm -hmm. um, so that was obviously huge that he came to me and said, hey, I think I have an idea of how it might work. Like... How but does it work? I always think about this. I'm like, is it on a wench that's, that's spring-loaded both ways? So there's a, a series of, the simplest way to put it is it's a series of torque-loaded spring mechanisms. So think of, you know, there's a spring in the base unit. If there's no resistance plates on it, that keeps the tension on it. Mm -hmm. And then the cable itself is, is wrapped around a specially shaped spool 
to allow it to slide smooth when it has the coil and recoil. But then by adding another resistance plate, there is another coil inside of that one and they interlock with a special like one way bearing so that it's only going to move one direction for yeah, that resistance. Looking at it. So, so for people who have never seen an anchor, uh, maybe we can, it'd be wise to create some B roll for you here. So hey, Daniel B roll for him here. It's when you look at the piece, there's no way to understand how this is working. If you don't have an engineering background, it's like magic. You just put a piece on the end, you twist it, you know, clockwise and, we're done. Yeah, feels that's good. It. Feels smooth. <laughs> that's and it. Click, turn, done. And for the engineers, they go, oh, that's a simple system. It, which, like, from, you know, engineering previews, like, it, the basic mechanics of it, if you add more springs or more tension to a central mechanism, it mm -hmm. is going to but it doesn't more. But for the layman, it doesn't yes. feel like it should be so simple. Mm -hmm. because, because I can go from two and a half pounds to, on my unit, I think, was it 75 pounds? You can uh, go. In, in, in under a minute without any... Heavy lifting. Like, I mean, the heavy, how heavy are the little discs? They're less than a pound. Right. So I can lift less than eight pounds and just go turn with two fingers and I'm at 70 plus pounds inside of a minute. And I can manipulate that two and a half pounds at a time. It's the, the combination of, you know, the mechanism that we use, like in the form factor it is that was unique. And obviously what was patentable was that, hey, these combination of parts and materials were never used in this fashion to produce this, you mm -hmm. know, for the training experience that we came about. Um, but this is one of those things where it's like very simple. If I say, Hey, it's the resistance is generated by these series of spring mechanisms, but down to the specific like testing and the fitment mm -hmm. and the tolerances and all the different pieces, like, you know, there's like a hundred unique pieces that go into it to build one. Like, there's definitely a lot more to the process than sure. people, you know, would assume. And then even for myself realizing like the amount of now testing machines that our team built internally to be able to control and run different materials. And, you know, we've, we've tested like 50 to a hundred different cables and ropes, mm -hmm. right? And the one we, this is what tests the best. So, you know what I mean? We're going to go for it. Um, but yeah, certainly a lot more than even I would have thought, you know, goes into I'm it. I'm picturing like behind you at your desk, there's just a machine arm that's just pulling. <laughs> All day long. That's why I got to have you come by, <laughs> come by our, our HQ now, which is uh, very different than the, the garage days. But but jumping back into, I know I was kind of sharing about the uh, experience at Babson was like, hey, he had this idea of, hey, this mechanism could work. And certainly the first one we, we made, he had a buddy down the road who had worked in an auto shop and had a 3D printer. Let us borrow the 3D printer. We made one. And it had maybe two feet of cable you could pull out of it. And you couldn't change the resistance. Mm -hmm. And the mount was via a luxury car roof rack suction cup. Okay. That's how we mounted it via suction cup. Well, all you were looking to do is test. Can we create something can that we, creates you know drag? And, and we thought this was unreal, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, we look at it now and it's like, you can't even do anything with that. Well, but it was that concept. We're like, wow, like this might work. It was kind of like people who think of the Wright brothers. Um, they're like, oh, these guys were the first in flight yeah, for eight seconds, <laughs> you know, or whatever it was. It wasn't long. Uh, so it's, it's the idea of like, it is possible. If we could do it for eight seconds, it is possible to do it across the Atlantic that's, Ocean. That's a great example because that's what happened. It gave us enough of like <clears throat> excitement to go, wow, like, well, how do we now make the resistance adjustable, right? Because we're thinking now, what do other people need adjustable and how are we going to mount it? Where are people going to use it? Okay, maybe we can come up with this interchangeable system because we don't know right now who and where are they going to use the product. How, how long did it take you from thought concept so like from tell, having a professor tell you this is not viable to selling your first unit online so we probably a couple like the first sales were ones that you know we were almost like beta testing so a few of those didn't happen online right, where I'm, there I'm not talking about it. like your aunt but it. um the first like you know real client it was you know less than a year really we were able to but it was because of 3d printing we were able to like that's the first big expense we both chipped in you know for a good 3d printer um, where you can 3D print full units. What does that cost to put 3D printer? At the time, probably $3,500 for, okay. for a good quality 3D printer. Okay, and that's then, less than I thought. And then, though, for that type of printer, proprietary material to feed the printer. That's where a lot of the cost comes, is that we've spent way more on 3D print material mm -hmm. than the actual printer itself. So did that's you, where they get you. I got you. So did you, um, did you raise money early on? 
we we did not. So this was, you know, we both chipped in a couple thousand dollars for that for that printer. Shoveling driveways and, in, in, in Buffalo in Boston. E- exactly. And then from from that, okay, we had that and the and the actual 3D print material, we were able to build some prototypes. And that's where we had the basic concept down. We were obviously talking with local, whether it's strength coaches or physical mm-hmm. therapists, of getting some, you know, feedback and okay, how do we make the cable smoother and how do we refine and you know make these mounts easier to use. All of that was kind of just happening in his dad, Nathaniel, his dad, you know, and mom, their parents' garage, mm-hmm. right? So we had no overhead, right? And we had a little space to work. Well, you had no no rent overhead. We had yeah, no rent overhead. We weren't paying like you I mean there was no revenue. It was not mm-hmm. right. It was just can we build this? And the expense were building prototypes. Like right. that was the only money that we had, um, and we were able to three D print fully usable units. And some of those three D print units, we were able to actually sell them, but you can't scale that because it took two days to print one unit. <laughs> so, you know, you're running the printer nonstop 24 mm-hmm. seven. You can't exactly make many per week, but we were actually able to sell those units. So that's where some of the money started to come. Where we realized too, like, wow, people are paying for the 3d print ones. And we even, you know, we actually even sold a couple to professional team that was 3d printed at the time. And they, you know what I mean? And coming out of the garage, Did you and, tell me like, Hey, we think it's going to work. But they had no idea it was coming out of the garage <clears throat> okay. either. But, um, we were, <laughs> it's amazing best. what, you know, we look back, it's like two, How do they find two guys in a garage and a 3d printer and we we're able to do this. It beats the shit out of karate was, in the garage. Was, <laughs> how, how, how did, uh, how did the pro team find you? Yeah. So that was through, uh, early coach of ours. One of, um, my college teammates who was training at this facility who we got in touch with, with him just through that connection. And he was mm-hmm. using our product and then he had a some type of consulting call on mm-hmm. zoom with like the New Jersey devils. And at the end of the call, it was a completely unrelated topic of training. Hey, you guys ever check this out? And right away, what, what the heck is that? And what he did was he did, he demonstrated a bunch of like high speed movements. So like, like on Whoa. zoom on zoom. And then <clears throat> right away they reached out to us. New Jersey devils reached out to us. They wanted it. And then a bunch of their players wanted it for the home gym. And once they had it, then, okay. Did you about shit your pants when that happened? That was, you know, I mean, it was definitely, I, you know, you're stoked, right? But right away, too, I'm the type of person where it's like, okay, this is like crazy exciting, but okay, we've got to execute this in terms of, okay, we got mm-hmm. to make sure we have the product. We got to make sure it works. And then how am I going to, you know, check in to make sure that, you know, the coach is happy with it. And, you know, are we going to be able to, you know, what's the next step after that, right? Well, I, I have so much interest right here because I think that what, <clears throat> what happened there is what I imagine, and I would love for you to tell me, yes, no. No, you know, don't make me feel good. Just tell me the truth. I imagine that could have been what I like to call a false peak, which means you're like, we have the New Jersey Devils. We're about to explode. It is over. Like every every hockey, your brain starts going to like the official cable column of the NHL. This is what's going to happen inside of a matter of weeks. How are we going to get all of these things built out for all of these teams? And then the Devils order, a few of their players order, and then it's over. And then you're waiting on, where's the, what about the rest of the, the league? Was any of that what happened? That, no, it's such a great point. Cause that's like the, the mindset I have is that it's, you know, it's, there's no like end game right. from that perspective. It's okay. How do we continue to, you know, chip away? And for us, we always took the slow and steady approach because one, we're, we're in the garage. We said, <laughs> Hey, we're going to try to bootstrap this because we realized, Oh wow. Like we can actually, maybe bootstrap this because we've got the engineering knowledge in house. You I mean, I'm out doing, you know, front end and talking to customers for feedback and okay, we're building them in the garage here. We're right now not paying rent. So, you know, expenses are, mm-hmm. are down. We're not paying ourselves anything. So, okay, maybe we can try to make this work. And that's when we decided to, you know, launch it out of school, but we did have a couple of those things where. When you, you know, launch it out of the school? Out of, um, like after, after, sorry, after we graduated I see. from Babson. So he was saying like, you know what? let's try to dive into this because this was kind of happening during school, mm-hmm. right? This is where it really started to take shape. And we said, oh, should we do it or not? But we had feedback too. Like I, I have to mention this before going forward because a lot of people, you know, love hearing this. We had to present what we were working on. So part of this was actually a class project. Mm-hmm. So we presented early on that, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to make this cable machine. And it was a pass-fail assignment on the presentation. And you either pass or fail, right? There's only two options. And there was no reason they could have failed us based on, you know, we did whatever, you know, check the boxes for the, for the assignment. We came back and we got all caps bolded, low pass, which is like, 
Like that's not even a category. Right, right, right. And it was because they didn't like they're like, you can't assume that people want this based on your experience. And I said, well, that's how exactly what we were doing. Yeah. How, what, right? well, well, how does anybody start Cause, anything? Because, you know, it was, hey, you had, didn't do the proper customer discovery and things like that. And which a lot of those things, you know, very beneficial for you know, a number of business. But for us, it was, hey, I felt yeah. I live this. I know other people who live this. And this, you know, would inherently be valuable. And, you know, part of it was, you know, a gut and, you know, could have been a little, you know, a little gung ho. But, you know, we really were like, this just makes sense. But that's so surprising to me because um, at an entrepreneur school, I would think that they would take the Henry Ford approach in some way. Like, have you ever heard Henry? Like, my favorite quote of all time is Henry Ford said, if I had asked the people what they wanted, they would have said faster Fast horses. horses. Yep. And so I, I feel like we're doing a parallel thing in a service industry to what you're doing in a mechanical industry in that I didn't go ask people, do you want yeah. a fitness professional who can bridge the gap between what your doctor can do and what the average fitness coach can do? It, would you, Hey, person who doesn't feel comfortable going to a gym, put yourself in the mind for a moment that you were comfortable going to a gym. What would you want the trainer there to do? They don't know. Cause they can't imagine going to a gym. It's surprising to me that the professors there wouldn't see that. And I think part of it was just, you know, the experience that I had personally, even for, for you, your experience, like that paved the way for kind of the vision of, hey, noticing a mm -hmm. gap that you could bridge and realizing that, hey, you mean certain of these professors, like they weren't in training or athletic, you know what I mean? And, and right. they just saw it differently. And I realized, mm -hmm. okay, well, that could be the same for me for another topic, right? I mm -hmm. could see something else and be like, oh, I don't know if that's a good idea, but part of it could just be I'm very removed I maybe see. from that industry. So that's what, you know what I mean? I try, to, I try to, you know, look back and reflect on that and say, hey, you know, what was the benefit? Because, you know, now there's a couple of those professors, you mean, still in touch, and, and we try to go back and, you know, share with students, hey, like this was only a few years ago. What we did, you mean, you guys can do this too. Because when I was in that class, we would have other alumni entrepreneurs come in and we'd be like, wow, like that's what we want to do. And, you know, they kind of propagated us too to come out of school and start it and think, hey, what can we accomplish here? And circling back to like, hey, an NHL team reaching out to us is like, whoa, like we're two guys in the garage and like right. this NHL coach is is reaching out to us and he definitely doesn't know we're in a garage. Mm -hmm. um, and so many, you know, we were in the garage for, for quite some time. Um, but okay, you know, avoiding that false peak was Did huge. Did my first unit come out of your garage? Uh, no, I, I, we were out of the garage. Okay. We were out of the garage. Okay. So damn it. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Late to the game. Um, I need you in my life more often. You're very level. I, I need, I, I like to think of myself as fairly level, but if there's like a, the middle is here and the top, like flying off the handle out of control is here. I go to like here, but you stay right here. I've, I've tried, I've tried to, you know what I mean? Keep, keep it level. <clears throat> like, because you know, easy, you can go up, you can go down and mm -hmm. it's, but also it's not to say, no, you don't get excited about things. I was, I was stoked, you know, right. when that happened, but it's to realize, okay, what do we need to do now to get a little further? Cause in our heads, we had definitely a further vision, right? Like, Hey, this could go much further, but we were very focused on like, okay, our most important thing right now is that coach needs to have a good experience, mm -hmm. right? That was the one thing that we need to make sure we had, because once that happened, everyone knows each other and talks, especially at that level to the mm -hmm. point where, Oh, he was using it. And then New Jersey or New York Rangers found out about it. And then the Arizona Coyotes and you know, Pittsburgh Penguins. So all these teams started finding out about it. And it was amazing that like such an early portion of our customer base were these like professional teams. So they all started buying from them. And it was wild for us to think like, okay, like you know, one, we're in the garage then. And how is, you know, this the case? And part of it was, okay, you know, the product is filling a void. And, you know, it allowed us some clarity around, you know, we knew there were certain problems that it solved um, that we've, you know, talked about when you, you know, kind of laid out what the product was. But, okay, like, why is it so unique to this group of clientele? And we realized, too, there's only so many NHL hockey teams. But, okay, it's, one, it's a very good, what I call, you know, I mean, it was a credibility builder for us, too, to realize that, hey, like, this is the top athletes, you know, in ice hockey in the entire world. Mm -hmm. And they're training on the product. There must be something unique about it, why they're attracted to it, but also realizing too that we built a product that, like I said, we focused on accessibility because it wasn't like a product where it's used by the pros, but there's no way it could get into a, you know, your local facility or training center or your home. 
because of price point and the size. So that was where we realized, okay, like that's really cool because we know we can live in a home gym, but the fact that we can live on this performance side, that was really cool to see that play out so early on for us. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. I had a, I was going to say something there and I just decided it wasn't appropriate (laughs) about my, about my wife. Um, (laughs) Yeah. She can, she can go anywhere is, is, is the the direction of where that was going to go. And what, what I'm curious, what was the void that you were filling for a professional team? Cause they, they have cable columns. Cause you think they have everything right. And you think of two, like these, you know, coaches, like, they know the latest and greatest, the right? First, and it's like the first thing that comes to mind for me when you're like, oh, you're hot pro hockey teams. I'm like, oh, yeah, they definitely had cables. Why would they need for, this? For sure. And part of it for them was training on the road. Yeah. That they, they use cable. They're great. You know what I mean? Most places have great home facilities. But then when you're on the road and when you're a hockey team, baseball team, you know, basketball, like those are sports where mm-hmm. such a large portion of the year you mm-hmm. are away from home. You are on the road. You mean like baseball, you're playing 81 games on the road, Mm -hmm. you know, hockey, you're playing over 40, right? Over 40 games, you know, 41 games on the road. So you're away a lot. And that's a good portion of time where, you know, what are you doing from a training perspective? Mm -hmm. And in those environments, you know, I mean, what are you doing for pulling or resistance training? And the answer was they really just had bands. What are they hooking up to on the road? So it got very creative. I bet. absolutely anything you could see that's a permanent <laughs> fixture okay. um they would strap it onto and certain ones in the nhl they had these different like carts with uh power block dumbbells on it so they were mm-hmm. using it with the power block dumbbells like I that see. was a a very popular use early on that we saw because we would ask them i said where are you putting this in the arena because we wanted to learn too like do we need to you know change some mounts maybe make something new sure. to try to make the product you know easily usable um in those environments but that was the gap for them um, it was on the road. Even, like I said, it was cool for us because, like, teams that had budgets and tons of, you know, high-quality training centers at their disposal still had a need for our product. Yeah. Like, that was the cool takeaway for us. That's a really cool takeaway. Huh. I, what, I, what I'm most impressed with so far about all of that is that um, when you got the New Jersey Devils, your first thought was, let's make sure it's a good experience. Not... Let's ask him who else we can get connected with. That's a lot of maturity really early on in a career. Now you've outfitted Alabama's strength room. Is it the same thing for them? Do they need to take it on the road? And were the pictures that you posted on Anchor's Instagram for effect? Or are they using them in the weight room? So those ones primarily will be actually in the weight room. So what's the what's the utility there? What they, Which they is, have to have Kaisers there, I'm sure. They they've got some really beautiful <laughs> equipment in in the Alabama football um, weight room. But once again, it, the versatility of, of the product, being the space saving aspect of it, that if you have you know 30 racks mm. in any training center, setting up 30 cable units. It's going to eat up a lot of space. And even if you have the budget, you know what, I can, we, let's build the facility bigger. You think about how big you're getting. And now you think of the flow and the efficiency of those training centers. You can have all of those cable stations on the racks right. for every single athlete <clears throat> at their disposal. So now it's a training capacity you know, solver, yeah. which is neat that you know we've learned, okay, there's so many different problems that we can solve. And depending on the client it's it's not gonna be the same for for each one and for us it was important to understand like you know you're not just telling someone the same thing hey this is what it does for you because it's like okay let's learn what are you looking for what what potential problems you have and then saying well hey this aspect of a product might be useful for you you know if you want to you know give it a try i i'm picturing strength coach work in the room you're giving a push and everybody same time and then it comes back in hold push hold uh, so I can see that being a utility I hadn't really thought of that. Cause are you familiar with Exos? Yes. Okay. So I was there 2017, 2018, something like that. And <clears throat> they have a bunch, like two or three Kaisers in their, in their, um, in their training floor for traditional cable work. They have them for squatting too, but, uh, you're right. They don't have enough for if every station there was to be working at the same time. You end up 
getting picked up by Sornex. And to me, that would be what I would consider the next false peak. You know, like it, that's got to be one of those moments for a product producer like you, who I, I consider you guys to be a brand, not just a product, but your core product is a tangible product. Mm -hmm. It's not community. It's not uh, education. It's, it's a product. You end up on a website that gets probably the second or third, I would say it's probably them, Rogue, and Perform Better are getting the most traffic for fitness products in the entire country. You end up on their website fairly prominently. They talked about you on their social media as a new product that they had now were going to be selling. That's got to be like, okay, we're, we're here time. It's definitely pretty cool. You mean the the relationship, you know, with with them, like just a you know, very storied brand, you know, that's mm -hmm. been around for a long time. And for us too to see the weight rooms that they're doing, because they're doing, you know, weight rooms that are just at such a scale that you know, I mean, we couldn't even think of. Like obviously, you mean Alabama, you know, was a, a huge project that they just did. Um, but right now, like in the U.S., like if you're not getting the product from from Anchor. I mean, you're either it's Sornex, and then we do work with Perform Better as well. Okay. Um, but the Sornex, you know, is crazy because they reach out to us, right? right? And and you know, that's something where it's it's pretty cool because I know other people too. When they create a fitness product, their first thing is trying to call up and, and pitch all these companies. Hey, sell my product, carry it, make it. Mm -hmm. And from day one, we took a very different approach. That hey, we are not going to rely on others. I think maybe is the best way to put it to try to build our brand, get our product out there. You know, these are things that we need to control, build and learn how to do on mm -hmm. our own to like build the foundation. And so when, you know, a company like that comes around, like it's a, it's like a great bonus, right? An incredible. Yeah. And they wanted to build a closer relationship with us too, which was, you know, really neat as well to see that, Hey, our product could plug and play anywhere on their rack to, add functionality for mm -hmm. the customer like that's what you know I mean, they saw and that hey it was you know a patented product it was something unique and you know i went down there to the to hq to to meet with their team and, and meet bert and show them the product and you know gave them some time with it too and you know they really liked it and wanted to see how they could get involved you know on a, on a deeper relationship level so we've certainly you know done a lot of events with them and um that's been you know really really cool because you have other people ask hey how did you get in with that and and almost anything that we've done has been word of mouth or someone reached out to us like you know, I mean we were very focused on you know we weren't certainly ever ignoring others or saying hey like you know I mean we're not working with them it's not worth it no it's never that it's been hey we really need to learn how to build this ourselves and so when someone else like that comes around to work with us you know we recognize hey like there's a huge you know opportunity there from an association but to the point of the false peak it's not that hey you get in there and then you just, okay, we can just sit back and, and coast now because the product's just gonna fly off the off the shelves and, and do it. No, it's saying, hey, like their sales are different too. They have salespeople. Right. And who who's selling the product in the, the day? It's going through those people. So it's hey, we've got to make sure we get in touch with their whole team and make sure that they know us and make sure that they're supported and we're checking in on them every month and they all have full knowledge of the product and they have their own and they can demo it and they know how to answer questions about it. Um, and that they actually believe it's valuable too, because mm -hmm. that's where the, you know, boots on the ground touch points are, are even happening for, you know, any, any company, whether that's Sornex or, or perform better. So, and we try to do more and it certainly, you know, comes back to a bandwidth thing on us and we've been growing our team because it's all these personal relationships. Like that's what it, it comes down to. Something I want people to understand because I think that there's going to be a, a level of, I don't want to say disbelief because it's the wrong way to describe it, but a level of must be nice, right? Oh, they made a cool product and everyone's talking about it. That must, like, how do you go viral like that is, is what I imagine people are going to be thinking about. And I'll share with, with all of you exactly how you've gone viral with us because we work with gyms around the world, hundreds of coaches from around the world. And we've worked with thousands of people, individuals from around the world. The reason that we tell everybody we work with, that the cable that we recommend you have, and we recommend you have a cable, is an anchor, has very little to do with how effective the anchor is. 
because there is competition and there is the perception that a narrow stack like the Nord cable stack would be more desirable for a gym that wants to load heavier. There is the perception that a functional patterns with a longer cable is and the long arms could be what they are looking for. I don't usually have to ask very many questions to say, I would strongly recommend you get Anchor and I can connect you with somebody over there if it would be useful. Because your customer service, your, I wouldn't even call it customer service, I would call it customer care, is off the charts. It's off the charts. I don't talk to people about how good the cable is. That's, that's like the assumed. If I'm telling you to get this cable, I'll let them tell you about the cable. Let me tell you about the people who work at Anchor. And I would be blown away if the same thing has not happened for you over and over and over again in all these other situations. The guy who introduced you to the devils knew you, knew you had integrity, liked your product. You, know, you have mm -hmm. to like the product. For sure. But he liked you and he liked your integrity, so he told somebody about the product that he liked when maybe otherwise he wouldn't have. I imagine that just kept on happening. And people are spreading what you do, not because you made the best product, even though you did, but because you made the best product and you're such high quality people. I believe that's the reason for most of your success. It's the value that people don't expect that they get in spades that makes it impossible not to talk positively about you. Well, thank you, Sean. That, that means a lot. You know what I mean? For all the things that, you know I mean? We've, we've done and we've chipped away at over time and you mean, you can call you mean successes and, and growth we've had, mm -hmm. you know, like hear, hearing that means a lot because it, you know, it exemplifies that, Hey, we, because it's true, you know, we do, we do care and we never want anyone, you know, to have a bad experience. We, mm -hmm. we don't want anyone to feel like they're, you know, left out, you know, and they bought a piece of equipment and they were left high and dry or some issue happened to it. Our, our biggest thing is if you have an issue, let us know and, and we're going to try to solve it as, as quick and as seamless as we can. Um, and that's just what we've done from, from day one. And, you know, thinking about even some of those initial relationships, like, um, you know, the, the friend who, who introduced me to the devils, Adrian Geyer, his train, you know what I mean? Thinking him, he's a strength condition coach, has his own facility. Like, you know, I think back, like what was the reason that he did that? Right. Like took time out of this zoom call to just show someone, right. He didn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. And then even the coach from the devils at the time, Devin McConnell, like for him to reach out and then also give us a, a testimonial unsolicited, right? Like there's just so many of these things where you look back at like so much value was created back to us. Mm -hmm. And I would think like, how come, you know, someone did it and, and trying to figure out like, why did they do that? From people who paid for it, by the way. Yeah, and these are people, you know, I mean, they owed us nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. And all the testimonies on our website, you I mean, they're all unsolicited. Like we didn't pay for a single, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Hey, here's, you know, the product and, and here's the, you know, money for a testimonial. We, we didn't do any of that. And we'd think, well, like you said, the basic is yes. You know, I mean, the product is providing some value. You know, that is a lot of value. It's a great product. important. Um, but no, we tried to build the connections and the relationships. And, and the thing I shared with you before was the sentiment that, Hey, we're never going to promise that there's not ever going to be an issue with your product. Like there mm -hmm. are wear and tear components in it, but we, Hey, it is replaceable. Or if you do have an issue, reach out. And that's the biggest thing, you know, that we've always tried to emphasize and try to think about too, how can we make things better for, for our clients? Like that is the, the big focus. And, you know, we're pretty simple and certainly a lot of people too, once we had these pro teams working with us, some people thought we were this huge company. Mm -hmm. Like, how did you get into all these places? And, and yet, you know what I mean? We're still like such a small team, you know, everyone's packing stuff out and shipping it. Um, Handwritten notes. You know, and that's, you know what I mean? The, the biggest one. We still do that to this day. I was going to say, keep that forever. Since the garage, you know, I used to, you know, write the majority of them, but mm -hmm. now we've other team members obviously helping with those. Um, but every single anchor unit, um, that we know the person's name, who's it's going to, because we've sometimes a, a partner by, and we, we don't know who the units are going to, but if we know the name of the person, their name is going to be written in ink and pen and with a personalized note. And then also a team member from ours, their cell phone number and mm -hmm. email so that you have a human to reach out to. If you have any questions, you need some help with something, you want some education, anything we can do, you have a direct human to go to. Yeah. And that was just super important to me. And that has done so so well for us because it's tough to scale, but we've 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 you managed don't need it. To we figured it out. 
it's not that tough to scale. I don't think as a guy who's never created a cable column or sold one because if enough people are buying them that you can't have one person keep up with writing you all the it. notes, you just hire someone to write notes. Exactly. That's it. Um, I, I scratch my curiosity itch or tell me to fuck off. What kind of a percent spike in revenue did you guys see in the 30 days after Sorenex picked you up from the 30 days before? For, you know, specific numbers that, you know, I don't even have that off my head, but part of it, we went into that knowing that there's no, the product gets listed mm -hmm. and it's like overnight it goes because we realized too. like so it It's not that. It, it's not an overnight thing. Now, have we seen really good growth? Um, yes. And that was what we were hoping for that, hey, sure. they're going to help us get into different places that we wouldn't like, you know, for us to get into Alabama, Alabama. Auburn, Florida State, Indiana, Michigan, like Alabama all these, and Auburn, you know huh? I mean? mm. So it's just thinking about all these places, like that was the value add in the relationship that they had. You know, I mean, they've been around for for decades and they've built up relationships that we as a new company just didn't have right. yet. But we knew that these sales operated on relationships. It wasn't, you know, what I mean, e-commerce. But no, this was. But so wait, do you get the relationship with the Alabama, or does Sornex have it, and you're a third, your party? So removed. we're in there. So, uh, so I went down obviously to the, to the weight mm -hmm. room, met with all the coaches, made sure that, Hey, if you have any issues with anchor, you have any questions about anchor. If I can help you with anything, they're going straight, straight to me. Awesome. You know what I mean? Sornix is a huge part of that, that deal in the relationship a hundred percent, but we make sure that like we want the customer touch point and also too, like we want the, the service touch point too. Like, it's not like, Hey, Sornix helped with this sale you guys deal with the servicing. No, we still want to build that sure. connection. And, and I'm sure Sornex loves that too. They don't have to worry and about it. I think it, it helps everybody all across the board. Were you, did you have to, it might sound great, like awesome. You doubled your sales, you tripled your sales, whatever it was. You also had to then double or triple your manufacturing. How hard was that to do? Because I imagine that there's this level of, all right, we're on Sornex's website now. Sales are going to go up. We have to be ready with inventory that's greater than we previously had, but we only have so much money to build inventory and we don't know what the demand is going. How did you manage that in between? Yeah, and it definitely, you know, it's a challenge since day one because we, we made that decision. Hey, we're going to try to bootstrap this. Yeah, and you still are bootstrapped? We are still bootstrapped. Mm -hmm. So we don't have any outside investors, um, VCs involved with the company. We've definitely, you know, had... People reach out with, you know, interest and, and we always, you know what I mean? We're happy to, you maybe chat at a, at a later time and, you know, who mm -hmm. knows what, you know, shape we'll take in the future. But right now that's, you know, the commitment we've made and it's allowed us a, a lot of agility and a lot of control over the processes. And one being that we've always done all of our assembly build in house. Mm -hmm. So since the garage, um, there were second facility, third facility to where we are today, we still have a, you know, full-time production crew. How you big know, is your facility now? So now our, our whole facility is about 11,000 square feet. Nice. So much bigger than a probably 250 square foot yeah. garage <laughs> a little uh, bit. room. Because even in the garage days, we started expanding into the rest of the house. Mm -hmm. And the inventory started filling all over the basement and everywhere. And, you know, once you're trying to bring a pallet jack down a sloped <laughs> driveway in Boston yeah. uh, in February, yeah, not, ideal. Ice, not, not ideal, nor is the residential Fun, community though. zoned for manufacturing. Yeah. Um, so we, we moved out of there quickly at the time. But, I hope you got uh, some videos and photos of that. We have a lot. And when you come visit the HQ, one thing we have is all our history. All the hallway, office hallways are just decked with pictures from day one all the way to That's present cool. day. Um, so people to see, you know, what it was like in, in the garage and beyond. Um, but a lot of our focus early on was engineering and production. So mm -hmm. we focused, you know, the first couple of years of the business were almost entirely back end focused, meaning, okay, getting the product right, um, having internal engineering team. Like, you know, we have full-time engineers on staff. That's, you know, a huge investment that we've made back in the business since day one on R and D that, you know, we don't get any immediate value for, you know, if we hire another engineer, we're getting ROI maybe a year and a half, two years down right. the road. So it's definitely, you know what I mean, tough for a small business to do that, but we made a commitment to that. Um, and also having all the tools and equipment in-house. So, you know, we have multiple 3D printers, CNC machines, cutters, welders, lathes, you know what I mean? You name it to be able to do all the metal work um, for especially small batch runs in-house. Um, but from production too, like making sure supply chain was a huge thing procuring like the raw materials, the parts with vendors. So that was the stuff we focused on early that when we got to junctures, you know, 
like Sornex or someone posting about us where, hey, there could be an increase in sales. We were in a good position mm-hmm. that that was no longer the lagging. Sometimes it was, you know, we got to order more parts. Usually that would be the concern then, hey, we can't build these fast enough because we also got much better at the process right. of how to build. Like we used to build them in the garage and some of the mechanisms we would, you know, you put your head away and you're trying to <laughs> build them. And now, you know what I mean? It's all the, you know, fixtures and, and there's just a streamlined process. So in those first couple of years though, everything on the front end was like word of mouth, right? You know, in zero, we had, you know, our, our marketing director, um, who was a Babson classmate, uh, Mike Carlson, his job was, Hey, we, uh, we have a budget of $0 for you. Um, make sure to, you know, have the website, social media, like what can you do that doesn't cost any money Mm -hmm. that can build brand rapport and continue to get the word out while we focus on the back end. And now we've kind of started to make that shift of, okay, how do we get the brand out there more because of these early investments in the back end that have definitely built a strong foundation so that, you know, we can avoid shortages and and keep up with production. Well, I could take a lesson from you guys because we just spent all of the money on the back end. And now it's time for people to start. Like, look, we we've we've done well for a fair amount of time. I won't call it a long time. We're we're like a we're still a toddler if we're thinking about company age. Actually, we're like five, so we're in between toddler and and child. But I have a six year old at home, and I have a four year old at home, so I know exactly where we live in terms of how mature we are. But it's time now for us to make sure the whole world knows what we've built, and and and. You guys are doing a great job of that. I'm curious for you because this is something that, that I run into from time to time when I deal with scarcity mind. Do you ever wonder like, oh, well, we built a good product, which means people won't need to buy a second one for like another five or 10 years. How many people are there who want to buy one? When have we reached market saturation? Even though it's absurd for either of us to be thinking that mm-hmm. way, we're not close. Does that ever creep into your mind? For, for sure. You mean thoughts like that. And, you know, other people bring that up too from a more like, hey, business advice standpoint and, you know, totally warranted. And you think of how many products or services out there where, hey, that can be the case, but these companies are, you know, they grow very successful or, you mean, large because the market's very big. Mm-hmm. And, you know, our focus is definitely, you know, the US. We've, we have, you know, it's been really cool. We've shipped over 60 different countries, which is amazing that, you mean, our product is, someone's looking at it in all these different places to, mm-hmm. to add it and that they're into training like that. But, um, there's a, a lot of one, I think the market is, is very large, but we're also developing new products to go after different ends of the market. Like right mm-hmm. now, you're not going to find us into, you know, uh, in a big box gym, right? A product is no reason isn't, f- like, you know what I mean? Isn't fit. So there's just certain training environments that are, you know, within the industry. Well, no, no, I want to push back. Um, the fit for your product in the big box gym is the big box gym that understands how to properly invest in their personal mm-hmm. training department because they will have a personal training space yep. where there will be anchors where the personal trainers have the ability to move them. And that doesn't exist today. And I've worked with enough big box gyms to see that their cable setups are the big towers or whatever, you know, big towers. And there's only so many, and there's a line to use them. And so trainers are like, ah. but And then you can't justify putting a big tower in the personal training space. Most gyms don't even have a dedicated personal training space. So now you do, and it's like, well, what's the footprint going to be? We can't put a big cable in there. Anchor's a perfect fit for that. And that, to me, is 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 a very good use case for yeah. Anchor in a big you, commercial. You, you know the landscape very well, because that's exactly where, when we look at those types of facilities, which historically that's not the target or the fit for us. It's those personal training spaces. But another one that's interesting too, that we're seeing some, some traction on is uh, group fitness. That, yeah, for sure. That, Hey, you know, how common are cable classes? Not, not common at all. So it's to say, Hey, we have a unique offering mm-hmm. where one from a, a space in a room, right? Are you going to have 20 cable machines? Right. And, and so one of our team members, uh, Rachel, who you, who you met, so she comes from a group fitness background and she piloted locally at a, at a facility, a full anchor class just recently. And, you know, full participation, the class was full. It had 14 people in every class, 14 units, anchor units set nice. up. And the entire class was done on the anchor. Um, so it was really neat too, cause it's a form resistance that's easier on your joints, but you can also build a good strength component to it. And it's you mean know, unique. So mm-hmm. in those you know box gyms that you mean have group fitness, we realize hey that's an area that 
this product might fit. And then in the future, as we're developing new products, there's definitely some products that we can come out to that will be a fit for some of those other spaces. Yeah. So for us, it, it really is the reinvestment in like engineering of what can we continue to build new that is better, that provides value for people that we can continue to, to introduce. Um, and it's that long-term, you know, investment to have the full-time engineers to, to try to do that. And it's a lot of refinement. And certainly for me, the appreciation of like what goes on behind the scenes from a design perspective too, when even we think about introducing a new product, we have to build all of the equipment to test the new equipment too. So it, you know, it, it turns into this big process, but that's where the future value for us is. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it's, and it's worth it because that's our, our heartbeat and our, our lifeline beyond, you know, the customer service and continuing to, you know, maintain that really high. It's our innovation. Yeah. I got some introductions to make for you. Well, thanks. You're, you're sparking some ideas. Thank you. You're welcome. Isaac, where can people find out more about you and anchor P- anchor? The, the biggest one, our website at anchortraining.com. So that's anchor spelled A N C O R E training.com. And then all our tags are the same. So Instagram is at anchor training. Um, those are the, the main two places that, you know, you're gonna be able to find us. And then our, our contact email is hello at anchor training.com. Definitely send us a message. And the other thing is too, we always encourage anyone who's in the Boston area, you know, come by. We, we love to show people a little bit of the behind the scenes and, you know, the amount of work that, that our team does behind the scenes, because everything that we've been able to hold up is because of our, our team. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's been incredible that, you know, we've, we've grown it and we've had a lot of new people over the years add to the team, um, which has been incredible to see the livelihoods we've built because that's who is ordering the parts. That is who is receiving the part, testing them, building them, shipping them, making sure we have support, making sure our marketing is here there. You mean it, we really tried to vertically integrate it. So for me to look back and see how many steps have to happen for things to go right and how well our team does that. Um, that's the biggest thing. So that's why I always love people to visit and, and, you know, really meet our team and, and see what they do behind the scenes, um, is always something we, we throw an open invite. Thank you for coming on. Hank. Well, thank you, I Sean. I appreciate it. I loved it. So. I almost called you anchor. <laughs> that's pretty much. I, I have an stuck. Instagram now that uh, Mike, our director of marketing, he was he's trying to trying to get me a little more social. It's uh it's iz dot anchor. So I guess mm. you know what I mean. There you go. Okay. So you know, hopefully get some more stuff out there for for the people. So thanks a lot, Sean. I appreciate it. You're welcome, bro. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Active Live podcast. Please remember, give us a hand, rate it, review it wherever you listen to shows. We are on a mission to humanize the healthcare industry by professionalizing the fitness industry to empower the individual to live a life unlimited by the way that their body looks, feels, or performs. If you are inspired by that mission and want to jump on the wagon, find us anywhere. Active Life Professional on Instagram. Active Life Rx on Instagram. Come to me personally at Dr. Sean Pestuch. We want to welcome you onto the train. We want you to be a part of the mission. We want to offer you the opportunity to pursue this right alongside us. We're inspired by your effort, and we hope to help you in your journey. Turn back.